Who Killed Zebedee? by Wilkie Collins A first word for myself. Before the doctor left me one evening, I asked him how much longer I was likely to live. He answered, It's not easy to say. You may die before I can get back to you in the morning, or you may live to the end of the month. I was alive enough on the next morning to think of the needs of my soul, and being a member of the Roman Catholic Church, to send for the priest. The history of my sins, related in confession, included blameworthy neglect of a duty which I owed to the laws of my country. In the priest's opinion, and I agreed with him, I was bound to make public acknowledgment of my fault as an act of penance becoming to a Catholic Englishman. We concluded thereupon to try a division of labour. I related the circumstances, while his reverence took the pen and put the matter into shape. Here follows what came of it. When I was a young man of five and twenty, I became a member of the London Police Force. After nearly two years' ordinary experience of the responsible and ill-paid duties of that vocation, I found myself employed on my first serious and terrible case of official inquiry, relating to nothing less than the crime of murder. The circumstances were these. I was then attached to a station in the northern district of London, which I beg permission not to mention more particularly. On a certain Monday in the week, I took my turn of night duty. Up to four in the morning, nothing occurred at the station house out of the ordinary way. It was then springtime, and between the gas and the fire, the room became rather hot. I went to the door to get a breath of fresh air, much to the surprise of our inspector on duty, who was constitutionally a chilly man. There was a fine rain falling, and a nasty damp in the air sent me back to the fireside. I don't suppose I had sat down for more than a minute when the swinging door was violently pushed open. A frantic woman ran in with a scream and said, "'Is this the station house?' Our inspector, otherwise an excellent officer, had, by some perversity of nature, a hot temper in his chilly constitution. "'Why, well, bless the woman, can't you see it is?' he says. "'What's the matter now?' "'Murder's the matter,' she burst out. "'For God's sake, come back with me. It's at Mrs. Cross Capel's lodging house, number 14 Lehigh Street. A young woman has murdered her husband in the night. With a knife, sir. She says she thinks she did it in her sleep.' I confess I was startled by this, and the third man on duty, a sergeant, seemed to feel it too. She was a nice-looking young woman, even in her terrified condition, just out of bed with her clothes, huddled on anyhow. I was partial in those days to a tall figure, and she was, as they say, my style. I put a chair for her, and the sergeant poked the fire. As for the inspector, nothing ever upset him. He questioned her as coolly as if it had been a case of petty larceny. "'Have you seen the murdered man?' he asked. "'No, sir.' "'Or the wife?' "'No, sir. I didn't dare go into the room. I only heard about it.' "'Oh. And who were you?' "'One of the lodgers?' "'No, sir. I'm the cook. Isn't there a master in the house?' "'Yes, sir. He's frightened out of his wits.' And the housemaid's gone for the doctor. He all falls on the poor servants, of course. Oh. Why did I ever set foot in that horrible house? The poor soul burst out crying and shivered from head to foot. The inspector made a note of her statement and then asked her to read it and sign it with her name. The object of this proceeding was to get her to come near enough to give him the opportunity of smelling her breath. When people make extraordinary statements, he afterwards said to me, it sometimes saves trouble to satisfy yourself that they are not drunk. I've known them to be mad, but not often. You'll generally find that in their eyes. She roused herself and signed her name, Priscilla Thirlby. 
The inspector's own test proved her to be sober, and her eyes, a nice light blue colour, mild and pleasant, no doubt, when they were not staring with fear and red with crying, satisfied him, as I supposed, that she was not mad. He turned the case over to me in the first instance. I saw that he didn't believe in it, even yet. "'Go back with her to the house,' he says. "'This may be a stupid hoax, or a quarrel exaggerated. "'Say to it yourself, and hear what the doctor says. "'If it is serious, send word back here directly, "'and let nobody enter the place or leave it till we come. "'Stop. "'You know the form, if any statement is volunteered?' "'Yes, sir. "'I am to caution the persons that whatever they say "'will be taken down and may be used against them. "'Quite right. "'You'll be an inspector yourself one of these days.' "'Now, miss.' "'With that he dismissed her, under my care. "'Lehigh Street was not very far off, "'about twenty minutes' walk from the station. "'I confess I thought the inspector had been rather hard on Priscilla. "'She was herself naturally angry with him. "'What does he mean?' she says, by talking of a hoax. Oh, "'I wish he was as frightened as I am. "'This is the first time I've been out at service, "'and I did think I had found a respectable place.' I said very little to her, feeling, if the truth must be told, rather anxious about the duty committed to me. On reaching the house, the door was opened from within before I could knock. A gentleman stepped out, who proved to be the doctor. He stopped the moment he saw me. "'You must be careful, policeman,' he says. I found the man lying on his back, in bed, dead, with the knife that had killed him left sticking in the wound.' Hearing this, I felt the necessity of sending at once to the station. Where could I find a trustworthy messenger? I took the liberty of asking the doctor if he would repeat to the police what he had already said to me. The station was not much out of his way home. He kindly granted my request. The landlady, Mrs. Cross Capel, joined us while we were talking. She was still a young woman, not easily frightened as far as I could see, even by a murder in the house. Her husband was in the passage behind her. He looked old enough to be her father, and he so trembled with terror that some people might have taken him for the guilty person. I removed the key from the street door after locking it, and I said to the landlady, "'Nobody must leave the house or enter the house till the inspector comes. I must examine the premises to see if anyone has broken in.' Well, "'There is the key of the area gate.' she said in answer to me. It's always kept locked. Come downstairs and see for yourself. Priscilla went with us. Her mistress set her to work to light the kitchen fire. Some of us, says Mrs. Cross Capel, may be the better for a cup of tea. I remarked that she took things easy under the circumstances. She answered that the landlady of a London lodging-house could not afford to lose her wits, no matter what might happen. I found the gate locked and the shutters of the kitchen window fastened. The back kitchen and back door were secured in the same way. No person was concealed anywhere. Returning upstairs, I examined the front parlour window. There, again, the barred shutters answered for the security of that room. A cracked voice spoke through the door of the back parlour. "'The policeman can come in,' it said. "'if he will promise not to look at me.' "'I turned to the landlady for information. "'It's my parlour lodger, Miss Mybus, she said. "'A most respectable lady. "'Going into the room, I saw something rolled up perpendicularly in the bed curtains. "'Miss Mybus had made herself modestly invisible in that way. "'Having now satisfied my mind about the security of the lower part of the house,' and having the key safe in my pocket, I was ready to go upstairs. On our way to the upper regions, I asked if there had been any visitors on the previous day. There had been only two visitors, friends of the lodgers, and Mrs. Cross Capel herself had let them both out. My next inquiry related to the lodgers themselves. On the ground floor there was Miss Mybus. On the first floor, occupying both rooms, Mr. Barfield, an old bachelor employed in a merchant's office. On the second floor, in the front room, Mr. John Zebedee, the murdered man, and his wife. In the back room, 
Mr. De Luc, described as a cigar agent and supposed to be a Creole gentleman from Martinique. In the front garret, Mr. and Mrs. Cross Capel. In the back garret, the cook and the housemaid. These were the inhabitants regularly accounted for. I asked about the servants. Both excellent characters, says the landlady, or they would not be in my service. We reached the second floor and found the housemaid on the watch outside the door of the front room. Not as nice a woman personally as the cook, and sadly frightened, of course. Her mistress had posted her to give the alarm in the case of an outbreak on the part of Mrs. Zebedee, kept locked up in the room. My arrival relieved the housemaid of further responsibility. She ran downstairs to her fellow servant in the kitchen. I asked Mrs. Cross Capel how and when the alarm of the murder had been given. Soon after three this morning, says she, I was woke by the screams of Mrs. Zebedee. I found her out here on the landing, and Mr. De Luc, in great alarm, trying to quiet her. Sleeping in the next room, he had only to open his door when her screams woke him. My dear John's murdered! I am the miserable wretch! I did it in my sleep! She repeated these frantic words over and over again until she dropped in a swoon. Mr. De Luc and I carried her back into the bedroom. We both thought the poor creature had been driven, distracted by some dreadful dream. But when we got to the bedside... Oh, don't ask me what we saw. The doctor's told you about it already. I was once a nurse in a hospital and accustomed, as such, to horrid sights. It turned me cold and giddy, notwithstanding. As for Mr. De Luke, I thought he would have had a fainting fit next. Hearing this, I inquired if Mrs. Zebedee had said or done any strange things since she had been Mrs. Cross Capel's lodger. Oh, you think she's mad? says the landlady. And anybody would be of your minds when a woman accuses herself of murdering her husband in her sleep. All I can say is that up to this morning a more quiet, sensible, well-behaved little person than Mrs. Zebedee I never met with. Oh, only just married, mine and as fond of her unfortunate husband as a woman could be. I should have called them a pattern couple in their own line of life. There was no more to be said on the landing. We unlocked the door and went into the room. He lay in bed on his back as the doctor had described him. On the left side of his nightgown, just over his heart, the blood on the linen told its terrible tale. As well as one could judge, looking unwillingly at a dead face, he must have been a handsome young man in his lifetime. It was a sight to sadden anybody, but I think the most painful sensation was when my eyes fell next on his miserable wife. She was down on the floor, crouched up in a corner, a dark little woman, smartly dressed in gay colours. Her black hair and her big brown eyes made the horrid paleness of her face look even more deadly white than perhaps it really was. She stared straight at us without appearing to see us. We spoke to her, and she never answered a word. She might have been dead, like her husband except that she perpetually picked at her fingers and shuddered every now and then as if she was cold. I went to her and tried to lift her up. She shrank back with a cry that well nigh frightened me, not because it was loud, but because it was more like the cry of some animal than of a human being. However quietly she might have behaved in the landlady's previous experience of her, she was beside herself now. I might have been moved by a natural pity for her, or I might have been completely upset in my mind. I only know this. I could not persuade myself that she was guilty. I even said to Mrs. Cross Capel, I don't believe she did it. While I spoke, there was a knock at the door. I went downstairs at once, and admitted to my great relief the inspector, accompanied by one of our men. 
He waited downstairs to hear my report, and he approved of what I had done. It looks as if the murder had been committed by somebody in the house. Saying this, he left the man below and went up with me to the second floor. Before he had been a minute in the room, he discovered an object which had escaped my observation. It was the knife that had done the deed. The doctor had found it left in the body, had withdrawn it to probe the wound, and had laid it on the bedside table. It was one of those useful knives which contain a saw, a corkscrew, and other like implements. The big blade fastened back, when open, with a spring. Except where the blood was on it, it was as bright as when it had been purchased. A small metal plate was fastened to the horn handle, containing an inscription only partly engraved, which ran thus, To John Zebedee, from... There it stopped. Strangely enough, who or what had interrupted the engraver's work? It was impossible even to guess. Nevertheless, the inspector was encouraged. This ought to help us, he said, and then he gave an attentive ear, looking all the while at the poor creature in the corner, to what Mrs. Crosscapel had to tell him. The landlady having done, he said he must now see the lodger who slept in the next bedchamber. Mr. De Luc made his appearance standing at the door of the room and turning away his head with horror from the sight inside. He was wrapped in a splendid blue dressing gown with a golden girdle and trimmings. His scanty brownish hair curled, whether artificially or not I am unable to say, in little ringlets. His complexion was yellow. His greenish-brown eyes were of the sort called goggle. They looked as if they might drop out of his face, if you held a spoon under them. His moustache and goat's beard were beautifully oiled, and to complete his equipment he had a long black cigar in his mouth. "'It isn't insensibility to this terrible tragedy,' he explained. "'My nerves have been shuttered, Mr. Policeman, and I can only repair the mischief in this way.' Be pleased to excuse and feel for me. The inspector questioned this witness sharply and closely. He was not a man to be misled by appearances, but I could see that he was far from liking or even trusting Mr. De Luc. Nothing came of the examination except what Mrs. Crosscapel had in substance already mentioned to me. Mr. De Luc returned to his room. "'How long has he been lodging with you?' the inspector asked, as soon as his back was turned. "'Nearly a year,' the landlady answered. "'Did he give you a reference?' "'As good a reference as I could wish for.' Thereupon she mentioned the names of a well-known firm of cigar merchants in the city. The inspector noted the information in his pocket-book. "'I would rather not relate in detail what happened next. It is too distressing to be dwelt on.' Let me only say that the poor, demented woman was taken away in a cab to the station-house. The inspector possessed himself of the knife and of a book found on the floor called The World of Sleep. The portmanteau containing the luggage was locked, and then the door of the room was secured, the keys in both cases being left in my charge. My instructions were to remain in the house and allow nobody to leave it until I heard again shortly from the inspector. The coroner's inquest was adjourned, and the examination before the magistrate ended in a remand, Mrs. Zebedee being in no condition to understand the proceedings in either case. The surgeon reported her to be completely prostrated by a terrible nervous shock. When he was asked if he considered her to have been a sane woman before the murder took place, he refused to answer positively at that time. A week passed. The murdered man was buried, his old father attending the funeral. I occasionally saw Mrs. Cross Capel and the two servants for the purpose of getting such further information as was thought desirable. Both the cook and the housemaid had given their month's notice to quit, declining in the interest of their characters to remain in a house which had been the scene of a murder. Mr. De Luc's nerves led also to his removal. 
His rest was now disturbed by frightful dreams. He paid the necessary forfeit money and left without notice. The first-floor lodger, Mr. Barfield, kept his rooms, but obtained leave of absence from his employers and took refuge with some friends in the country. Miss Mybus alone remained in the parlours. "'When I am comfortable,' the old lady said, "'nothing moves me at my age. "'A murder up two pairs of stairs "'is nearly the same thing as a murder in the next house. "'Distance, you see, makes all the difference.' It mattered little to the police what the lodgers did. We had men in plain clothes watching the house night and day. Everybody who went away was privately followed, and the police in the districts to which they retired were warned to keep an eye on them after that. As long as we failed to put Mrs. Zebedee's extraordinary statement to any sort of test, to say nothing of having proved unsuccessful thus far in tracing the knife to its purchaser, we were bound to let no person living under Mr. Cross Capel's roof on the night of the murder slip through our fingers. In a fortnight more, Mrs. Zebedee had sufficiently recovered to make the necessary statements, after the preliminary caution addressed to persons in such cases. The surgeon had no hesitation now in reporting her to be a sane woman. Her station in life had been domestic service, she had lived for four years in her last place as lady's maid, with a family residing in Dorsetshire. The one objection to her had been the occasional infirmity of sleep-walking, which made it necessary that one of the other female servants should sleep in the same room, with the door locked and the key under her pillow. In all other respects, the lady's maid was described by her mistress as a perfect treasure. In the last six months of her service, a young man named John Zebedee entered the house with a written character as a footman. He soon fell in love with the nice little lady's maid, and she heartily returned the feeling. They might have waited for years before they were in a pecuniary position to marry, but for the death of Zebedee's uncle, who left him a little fortune of two thousand pounds. They were now, for persons in their station, rich enough to please themselves, and they were married from the house in which they had served together, the little daughters of the family showing their affection for Mrs. Zebedee by acting as her bridesmaids. The young husband was a careful man. He decided to employ his small capital to the best advantage by sheep farming in Australia. His wife made no objection. She was ready to go wherever John went. Accordingly, they spent their short honeymoon in London, so as to see for themselves the vessel in which their passage was to be taken. They went to Mrs. Cross Capel's lodging-house, because Zebedee's uncle had always stayed there when in London. Ten days were to pass before the day of embarkation arrived. This gave the young couple a welcome holiday and a prospect of amusing themselves to their heart's content among the sights and shows of the great city. On their first evening in London they went to the theatre. They were both accustomed to the fresh air of the country, and they felt half stifled by the heat and the gas. However, they were so pleased with an amusement which was new to them that they went to another theatre on the next evening. On this second occasion John Zebedee found the heat unendurable. They left the theatre and got back to their lodgings till ten o'clock. Let the rest be told in the words used by Mrs. Zebedee herself. She said, We sat talking for a little while in our room, and John's headache got worse and worse. I persuaded him to go to bed, and I put out the candle, the fire giving sufficient light to undress by, so that he might the sooner fall asleep. But he was too restless to sleep. He asked me to read him something. Books always made him drowsy at the best of times. I had not myself begun to undress, so I lit the candle again, and I opened the only book I had. John had noticed it at the railway bookstall by the name of The World of Sleep. He used to joke with me about my being a sleepwalker, and he said, Here's something that's sure to interest you, and he made me a present of the book. Before I'd read to him for more than half an hour, he was fast asleep. Not feeling that way inclined, I went on reading to myself. The book did indeed interest me. There was one terrible story which took a hold on my mind. 
the story of a man who stabbed his own wife in a sleepwalking dream. I thought of putting down my book after that, and then changed my mind again and went on. The next chapters were not so interesting. They were full of learned accounts of why we fall asleep and what our brains do in that state and such like. It ended in my falling asleep, too, in my armchair by the fireside. I don't know what o'clock it was when I went to sleep. I don't know how long I slept or whether I dreamed or not. The candle and the fire had both burned out, and it was pitch dark when I woke. I can't even say why I woke, unless it was the coldness of the room. There was a spare candle on the chimney-piece. I found the matchbox and got a light. Then, for the first time, I turned round toward the bed, and I saw... She had seen the dead body of her husband, murdered while she was unconsciously at his side, and she fainted, poor creature, at the bare remembrance of it. The proceedings were adjourned. She received every possible care and attention, the chaplain looking after her welfare as well as the surgeon. I've said nothing of the evidence of the landlady and servants. It was taken as a mere formality. What little they knew proved nothing against Mrs. Zebedee. The police made no discoveries that supported her first frantic accusation of herself. Her master and mistress, where she had been last in service, spoke of her in the highest terms. We were at a complete deadlock. It had been thought best not to surprise Mr. De Luc as yet by citing him as a witness. The action of the law was, however, hurried in this case by a private communication received from the chaplain. After twice seeing and speaking with Mrs. Zebedee, the reverend gentleman was persuaded that she had no more to do than himself with the murder of her husband. He did not consider that he was justified in repeating a confidential communication he would only recommend that Mr. De Luc should be summoned to appear at the next examination. This advice was followed. The police had no evidence against Mrs. Zebedee when the inquiry was resumed. To assist the ends of justice, she was now put into the witness box. The discovery of her murdered husband, when she woke in the small hours of the morning, was passed over as rapidly as possible. Only three questions of importance were put to her. First, the knife was produced. Had she ever seen it in her husband's possession? Never. Did she know anything about it? Nothing whatever. Secondly, did she, or did her husband, lock the bedroom door when they returned from the theatre? No. Did she afterward lock the door herself? No. Thirdly, had she any sort of reason to give for supposing that she had murdered her husband in a sleep-walking dream? No reason, except that she was beside herself at the time, and the book put the thought into her head. After this, the other witnesses were sent out of court. The motive for the chaplain's communication now appeared. Mrs. Zebedee was asked if anything unpleasant had occurred between Mr. De Luc and herself. Yes. He had caught her alone on the stairs at the lodging-house, had presumed to make love to her, and had carried the insult still farther by attempting to kiss her. She had slapped his face, and had declared that her husband should know of it, if his misconduct was repeated. He was in a furious rage at having his face slapped, and he said to her, Madame, you may live to regret this. 
After consultation, and at the request of our inspector, it was decided to keep Mr. De Luc in ignorance of Mrs. Zebedee's statement for the present. When the witnesses were recalled, he gave the same evidence which he had already given to the inspector, and he was then asked if he knew anything of the knife. He looked at it without any guilty signs in his face, and swore that he had never seen it until that moment. The resumed inquiry ended, and still nothing had been discovered. But we kept an eye on Mr. De Luc. Our next effort was to try if we could associate him with the purchase of the knife. Here again there really did seem to be a sort of fatality in this case. We reached no useful result. It was easy enough to find out the wholesale cutlers who had manufactured the knife at Sheffield by the mark on the blade. But they made tens of thousands of such knives and disposed of them to retail dealers all over Great Britain, to say nothing of foreign parts. As to finding out the person who had engraved the imperfect inscription without knowing where or by whom the knife had been purchased, we might as well have looked for the proverbial needle in the bundle of hay. Our last resource was to have the knife photographed, with the inscribed side uppermost, and to send copies to every police station in the kingdom. At the same time we reckoned up Mr. De Luc. I mean that we made investigations into his past life on the chance that he and the murdered man might have known each other and might have had a quarrel or a rivalry about a woman on some former occasion. No such discovery rewarded us. We found De Luc to have led a dissipated life and to have mixed with very bad company, but he had kept out of reach of the law. A man may be a profligate vagabond, may insult a lady, may say threatening things to her in the first stinging sensation of having his face slapped, but it doesn't follow from these blots on his character that he has murdered her husband in the dead of the night. Once more, then, when we were called upon to report ourselves, we had no evidence to produce. The photographs failed to discover the owner of the knife and to explain its interrupted inscription. Poor Mrs. Zebedee was allowed to go back to her friends, on entering into her own recognizance to appear again if called upon. Articles in the newspapers began to inquire how many more murderers would succeed in baffling the police. The authorities at the Treasury offered a reward of a hundred pounds for the necessary information. And the weeks passed, and nobody claimed the reward. Our inspector was not a man to be easily beaten. More inquiries and examinations followed. It is needless to say anything about them. We were defeated. And there, so far as the police and the public were concerned, was an end of it. The assassination of the poor young husband soon passed out of notice, like other undiscovered murders. One obscure person only was foolish enough in his leisure hours to persist in trying to solve the problem of who killed Zebedee. He felt that he might rise to the highest position in the police force if he succeeded where his elders and betters had failed, and he held to his own little ambition, though everybody laughed at him. In plain English, I was the man. Without meaning it, I have told my story ungratefully. There were two persons who saw nothing ridiculous in my resolution to continue the investigation single-handed. One of them was Miss Mybus, and the other was the cook, Priscilla Thirlby. Mentioning the lady first, Miss Mybus was indignant at the resigned manner in which the police accepted their defeat. She was a little bright-eyed, wiry woman, and she spoke her mind freely. "'This comes home to me,' she said. "'Just look back for a year or two. "'I can call to mind two cases of persons found murdered in London, "'and the assassins have never been traced. "'I am a person, too, and I ask myself if my turn is not coming next. "'You're a nice-looking fellow, and I like your pluck and perseverance. "'Come here as often as you think right.' and say you are my visitor if they make any difficulty about letting you in. One thing more. 
"'I have nothing particular to do, and I am no fool. "'Here, in the parlours, I see everybody who comes into the house "'or goes out of the house. "'Leave me your address. "'I may get some information for you yet.' "'With the best intentions, Miss Mybus found no opportunity of helping me. "'Of the two, Priscilla Thirlby seemed more likely to be of use.' In the first place he was sharp and active, and, not having succeeded in getting another situation as yet, was mistress of her own movements. In the second place she was a woman I could trust. Before she left home to try domestic service in London, the parson of her native parish gave her a written testimonial, of which I append a copy. Thus it ran. I gladly recommend Priscilla Thirlby for any respectable employment which she may be competent to undertake. Her father and mother are infirm old people who have lately suffered a diminution of their income, and they have a younger daughter to maintain. Rather than be a burden on her parents, Priscilla goes to London to find domestic employment and to devote her earnings to the assistance of her father and mother. This circumstance speaks for itself. I have known the family many years, and I only regret that I have no vacant place in my own household which I can offer to this good girl. Signed, Henry Derrington, Rector of Roth. After reading those words, I could safely ask Priscilla to help me in reopening the mysterious murder case to some good purpose. My notion was that the proceedings of the persons in Mrs. Cross Capel's house had not been closely enough inquired into yet. By way of continuing the investigation, I asked Priscilla if she could tell me anything which associated the housemaid with Mr. De Luc. She was unwilling to answer. I may be casting suspicion on an innocent person, she said. Besides, I was for so short a time the housemaid's fellow servant. "'You slept in the same room with her,' I remarked. "'And you had opportunities of observing her conduct toward the lodgers. "'If they had asked you at the examination what I now ask, "'you would have answered as an honest woman.' "'To this argument she yielded. "'I heard from her certain particulars which threw a new light on Mr. De Luc "'and on the case generally. "'On that information I acted.' It was slow work, owing to the claims on me of my regular duties, but, with Priscilla's help, I steadily advanced toward the end I had in view. Besides this, I owed another obligation to Mrs. Crosscaple's nice-looking cook. The confession must be made sooner or later, and I may as well make it now. I first knew what love was, thanks to Priscilla. I had delicious kisses, thanks to Priscilla. And when I asked if she would marry me, she didn't say no. She looked, I must own, a little sadly, and she said, How can two such poor people as we are ever hope to marry? To this I answered, It won't be long before I lay my hand on the clue which my inspector has failed to find. I shall be in a position to marry you, my dear, when that time comes. At our next meeting we spoke of her parents. I was now her promised husband. Judging by what I had heard of the proceedings of other people in my position, it seemed to be only right that I should be made known to her father and mother. She entirely agreed with me, and she wrote home that day to tell them to expect us at the end of the week. I took my turn of night duty, and so gained my liberty for the greater part of the next day. I dressed myself in plain clothes, and we took our tickets on the railway for Yateland, being the nearest station to the village in which Priscilla's parents lived. The train stopped, as usual, at the big town of Waterbank. Supporting herself by her needle while she was still unprovided with a situation, Priscilla had been at work late in the night. She was tired and thirsty. I left the carriage to get her some soda-water. The stupid girl in the refreshment room failed to pull the cork out of the bottle and refused to let me help her. She took a corkscrew and used it crookedly. I lost all patience and snatched the bottle out of her hand. Just as I drew the cork, the bell rang on the platform. I only waited to pour the soda-water into a glass, 
but the train was moving as I left the refreshment room. The porters stopped me when I tried to jump onto the step of the carriage. I was left behind. As soon as I had recovered my temper, I looked at the timetable. We had reached Waterbank at five minutes past one. By good luck, the next train was due at forty-four minutes past one, and arrived at Yateland, the next station, ten minutes afterward. I could only hope that Priscilla would look at the timetable, too, and wait for me. If I had attempted to walk the distance between the two places, I should have lost time instead of saving it. The interval before me was not very long. I occupied it in looking over the town. Speaking with all due respect to the inhabitants, Waterbank, to other people, is a dull place. I went up one street and down another, and stopped to look at a shop which struck me not from anything in itself, but because it was the only shop in the street with the shutters closed. A bill was posted on the shutters, announcing that the place was to let. The outgoing tradesman's name and business announced in the customary painted letters ran thus, James Wickham, Cutler, etc. For the first time it occurred to me that we had forgotten an obstacle in our way when we distributed our photographs of the knife. We had none of us remembered that a certain proportion of cutlers might be placed by circumstances out of our reach, either by retiring from business or by becoming bankrupt. I always carried a copy of the photograph about me, and I thought to myself, here is the ghost of a chance of tracing the knife to Mr. De Luc. The shop door was opened, after I had twice rung the bell, by an old man, very dirty and very deaf. He said, You had better go upstairs and speak to Mr. Scorrier, top of the house. I put my lips to the old fellow's ear trumpet and asked who Mr. Scorrier was. Brother in law to Mr. Wickham. Mr. Wickham's dead. If you want to buy the business, apply to Mr. Scorrier. Receiving that reply, I went upstairs and found Mr. Scorrier engaged in engraving a brass door plate. He was a middle aged man with a cadaverous face and dim eyes. After the necessary apologies, I produced my photograph. "'May I ask, sir, if you know anything of the inscription on that knife?' I said. He took his magnifying glass to look at it. "'This is curious,' he remarked quietly. "'I remember the queer name. Zebedee. Yes, sir. I did the engraving, as far as it goes.' I wonder what prevented me from finishing it. The name of Zebedee and the unfinished inscription on the knife had appeared in every English newspaper. He took the matter so coolly that I was doubtful how to interpret his answer. Was it possible that he had not seen the account of the murder? Or was he an accomplice with prodigious powers of self-control? Excuse me, I said. Do you read the newspapers? Never. My eyesight is failing me. I abstain from reading in the interests of my occupation. Have you not heard the name of Zebedee mentioned, particularly by people who do read the newspapers? Very likely, and I didn't attend to it. When the day's work is done, I take my walk. Then I have my supper, my drop of grog, and my pipe. Then I go to bed. A dull existence, you think? I dare say. I had a miserable life, sir, when I was young. A bare subsistence and a little rest before the last perfect rest in the grave. That is all I want. The world has gone by me long ago. So much the better. The poor man spoke honestly. I was ashamed of having doubted him. I returned to the subject of the knife. "'Do you know where it was purchased, and by whom?' I asked. "'My memory is not so good as it was,' he said, "'but I have got something by me that helps it.' He took from a cupboard a dirty old scrapbook. Strips of paper with writing on them were pasted on the pages, as well as I could see. 
He turned to an index or table of contents and opened a page. Something like a flash of life showed itself on his dismal face. Ah, yeah, now I remember, he said. The knife was bought of my late brother-in-law in the shop downstairs. It all comes back to me, sir. A person in a state of frenzy burst into this very room and snatched the knife away from me when I was only halfway through the inscription. I felt that I was now close on discovery. May I see what it is that has assisted your memory? I asked. Oh, yes. You must know, sir, I live by engraving inscriptions and addresses, and I paste in this book the manuscript instructions which I receive, with marks of my own on the margin. For one thing they serve as a reference to new customers, and for another thing they do certainly help my memory. He turned the book toward me and pointed to a slip of paper which occupied the lower half of a page. I read the complete inscription, intended for the knife that killed Zebedee, and written as follows. To John Zebedee, from Priscilla Thirlby. I declare that it is impossible for me to describe what I felt when Priscilla's name confronted me like a written confession of guilt. How long it was before I recovered myself in some degree, I cannot say. The only thing I can clearly call to mind is that I frightened the poor engraver. My first desire was to get possession of the manuscript inscription. I told him I was a policeman and summoned him to assist me in the discovery of a crime. I even offered him money. He drew back from my hand. "'You shall have it for nothing,' he said, "'if you will only go away and never come here again.' He tried to cut it out of the page, but his trembling hands were helpless. I cut it out myself and attempted to thank him. He wouldn't hear me. "'Go away,' he said. "'I don't like the look of you.' It may be here objected that I ought not to have felt so sure as I did of the woman's guilt until I had got more evidence against her. The knife might have been stolen from her, supposing she was the person who had snatched it out of the engraver's hands, and might have been afterward used by the thief to commit the murder. All very true. But I never had a moment's doubt in my own mind from the time when I read the damnable line in the engraver's book. I went back to the railway without any plan in my head. The train by which I had proposed to follow her had left Waterbank. The next train that arrived was for London. I took my place in it, still without any plan in my head. At Charing Cross a friend met me. He said, you're looking miserably ill. Come and have a drink. I went with him. The liquor was what I really wanted. It strung me up and cleared my head. He went his way, and I went mine. In a little while more, I determined what I would do. In the first place, I decided to resign my situation in the police from a motive which will presently appear. In the second place, I took a bed at a public house. She would no doubt return to London, and she would go to my lodgings to find out why I had broken my appointment. To bring to justice the one woman whom I had dearly loved was too cruel a duty for a poor creature like me. I preferred leaving the police force. On the other hand, if she and I met before time had helped me to control myself, I had a horrid fear that I might turn murderer next and kill her then and there. The wretch had not only all but misled me into marrying her, but also into charging the innocent housemaid with being concerned in the murder. The same night I hit on a way of clearing up such doubts as still harassed my mind. I wrote to the rector of Roth, informing him that I was engaged to marry her, and asking if he would tell me, in consideration of my position, 
What her former relations might have been with the person named John Zebedee. By return of post, I got this reply. Sir, under the circumstances, I think I am bound to tell you confidentially what the friends and well-wishers of Priscilla have kept secret for her sake. Zebedee was in service in this neighbourhood. I am sorry to say it of a man who has come to such a miserable end, but his behaviour to Priscilla proves him to have been a vicious and heartless wretch. They were engaged, and I add with indignation he tried to seduce her under a promise of marriage. Her virtue resisted him, and he pretended to be ashamed of himself. The bans were published in my church. On the next day Zebedee disappeared and cruelly deserted her. He was a capable servant, and I believe he got another place. I leave you to imagine what the poor girl suffered under the outrage inflicted on her. Going to London with my recommendation, she answered the first advertisement that she saw, and was unfortunate enough to begin her career in domestic service in the very lodging-house to which, as I gather from the newspaper report of the murder, the man Zebedee took the person whom he married after deserting Priscilla. Be assured that you are about to unite yourself to an excellent girl, and accept my best wishes for your happiness. It was plain from this that neither the rector nor the parents and friends knew anything of the purchase of the knife. The one miserable man who knew the truth was the man who had asked her to be his wife. I owed it to myself, at least so it seemed to me, not to let it be supposed that I, too, had meanly deserted her. Dreadful as the prospect was, I felt that I must see her once more, and for the last time. She was at work when I went into her room. As I opened the door, she started to her feet, her cheeks reddened and her eyes flashed with anger. I stepped forward, and she saw my face. My face silenced her. I spoke in the fewest words I could find. I have been to the cutler's shop at Waterbank, I said. There is the unfinished inscription on the knife, complete in your handwriting. I could hang you by a word. God forgive me. I can't say the word. Her bright complexion turned to a dreadful clay colour. Her eyes were fixed and staring like the eyes of a person in a fit. She stood before me, still and silent. Without saying more, I dropped the inscription into the fire. Without saying more, I left her. I never saw her again. But I heard from her a few days later. The letter has long since been burned. I wish I could have forgotten it as well. It sticks to my memory. If I die with my senses about me, Priscilla's letter will be my last recollection on earth. In substance, it repeated what the rector had already told me. Further, it informed me that she had bought the knife as a keepsake for Zebedee in place of a similar knife which he had lost. On the Saturday, she made the purchase and left it to be engraved. On the Sunday, the bands were put up. On the Monday, she was deserted, and she snatched the knife from the table while the engraver was at work. She only knew that Zebedee had added a new sting to the insult inflicted on her when he arrived at the lodgings with his wife. Her duties as cook kept her in the kitchen, and Zebedee never discovered that she was in the house. I still remember the last lines of her confession. The devil entered into me when I tried their door, on my way up to bed, and found it unlocked and listened a while, and peeped in. I saw them by the dying light of the candle, one asleep on the bed, the other asleep by the fireside. I had the knife in my hand, and the thought came to me to do it. 
so that they might hang her for the murder. I couldn't take the knife out again when I had done it. Mind this. I did really like you. I didn't say yes because you could hardly hang your own wife if you found out who killed Zebedee. Since the past time, I have never heard again of Priscilla Thurlby. I don't know whether she is living or dead. Many people may think I deserve to be hanged myself for not having given her up to the gallows. They may perhaps be disappointed when they see this confession, and hear that I have died decently in my bed. I don't blame them. I am a penitent sinner. I wish all merciful Christians goodbye forever. Pickup was reading Who Killed Zebedee by Wilkie Collins. The producer was Joanne Reardon. <laughs>